you for uh, attending uh, tonight's uh, presentation. The presentation is uh, organized in roughly two parts. The first part, which gives an overview of the project uh, and the design aspects uh, will be done by myself. And after that, I will pass to Marwan's very capable hands to discuss with you about, to present to you the, uh, the construction part. Um, I apologize that I've got another meeting at the other end of London, so I'll leave around uh, 35 past, so I won't be here for the question and answer, but Marwan is every day on this project, so he knows it very well, so he should be able to answer most of them. So the first part is the general presentation. Um, wasn't sure how many of you uh, know all the details of HS2, so the first slide was really to give a, a broad overview of uh, HS2 uh, uh, phase one here. So uh, London to Birmingham, obviously, uh, cut in uh, broadly three sections, the south, the center, and the north. If we look at the south, it's all tunnels coming out of London. Uh, and in the central section, section C1, which is the one where Marwan and I are involved, is when the trains come out of the tunnels coming out of London, get onto the Corn Valley Viaduct, and then go again in a tunnel to go under the M25, under the Chilterns, coming out around Amersham. Then it's mainly at grade over uh, most of the length. And then uh, in N1 and N2, the northern section, you start having a bit of tunnels and um, and viaducts again. So the section that uh, Marwan and I are involved is C1, package uh, central package number one, which broadly starts just before the M25 and goes for about uh, 25 kilometers. So Marwan, if you go to the next one. Um, so the uh, the contract C1 has been awarded to a, a joint venture consisting of uh, three partners. I think we have a slide uh, after on that. I'll uh, no. If you go back, Marwan, sorry to the to the overall uh, view. So package C1, it's uh, two main parts to the package. One is, which is the Corn Valley Viaduct, which is the 3.4 kilometer viaduct, and then the broadly uh, 16 kilometer uh, tunnels. The contract, uh, as all the other civil contracts, was awarded in uh, 2017. Uh, we had a first stage which was quite long of uh, design and establishing target costs, etc. And we've been on site now for about uh, uh, two and a bit years. So exact length 21.6 kilometers, 3.4 kilometer viaduct, 2.2 times 16 kilometer twin board tunnel, so one tunnel for each uh, track. Progress today is fantastic in our eyes. 98% of the boring of the tunnel is uh, complete. All the segments that form the rings of the tunnel uh, have been cast, and we should be seeing the first TBM coming out of the ground uh, any day now. In terms of the viaduct, which is really where this uh, presentation focuses, uh, we've got more than two thirds of the viaduct uh, length has been completed with 80% uh, of the precast segments already cast. So you see on the map broadly, we start just inside the M25 and we go for 20 kilometers and we come out uh, in the chill turns uh, a bit after Amersham. If we go to the next slide, so package C1 of HS2 has been awarded to a joint venture. So obviously, the ultimate client is Department of Transport, who have uh, entrusted HS2 Limited, which is a private company uh, wholly owned by the government, to uh, procure and uh, supervise the execution of uh, all these packages. And package C1 has been awarded to a joint venture consisting of Bouygues Travel Public, so Bouygues Civil Works, uh, for whom I work, who are the main party in the aligned joint venture at 60% and 20% each to our two other partners, Volker Fitzpatrick and Sir Robert McAlpine. The design, because this is a design and build project, uh, has been uh, subcontracted by the joint venture to what is called Align D, so the Align Design Joint Venture, which is formed 20% Align itself and um, 
the the rest 48 percent and 37 uh, percent to uh, Jacobs and uh, so, uh, 32 percent sorry to Jacobs and uh, Engerop uh, Randall. In terms of execution of the project, uh, foundations for the viaduct have been uh, completed by a joint venture of Keller and VSL, peers by Kilnbridge, Mauer's spherical bearings, the deck installation, which is where we are going to mainly focus in this presentation, uh, is being carried out by VSL with the precasting of the segments because this is a precast segmental structure. We will get to that. Um, being done by the joint venture themselves with uh, specialist equipment designed and supplied by VSL. Um, and of, obviously the erection is VSL with the post tensioning. We'll get to that. So the design organization um, had a very large scope, which uh, included uh, the optioneering, the consent, the preliminary final design, and a large ar architectural package. So the design is an integrated consortium for all the permanent works. As I said, Jacobs, Angero, Prendol, and Align, with key subcontractors, LDA Design for the Landscape, Grimshaw as the architects, and Catherine Check in fact, subcontracted to um, a joint venture of Arcadis, Kowi, and Setec, who are the designers of C2, C3 section further north, which means that it was a very efficient way to do it because they already have a very good knowledge of our common client HS2 and the way uh, the, way, uh, the systems work and uh, a lot of experience in uh, from their own packages to provide independent checking for our own package. So the Combe Valley Viaduct, if we look in the second section at the, the context, the Combe Valley is the first open air uh, section out of London, where the train uh, emerges out of the tunnels. It's really the first really green area uh, outside of London within the M25, and it's an environmentally sensitive area because we go through uh, woodlands, and uh, lakes. So even though the lakes are uh, remnants of uh, of old quarries which have uh, filled since, it's uh, teams with a lot of uh, marine life or water life. Uh, so it's quite an important um, uh, area that we are going through. So if we go uh, in terms of uh, how the viaduct was uh, procured. So uh, what people don't uh, necessarily realize is that at the time of tender, the the concept for the viaduct was totally open. There was no reference designed to be followed uh, from the client, which means that um, getting the concept for the viaduct was a really critical part of the works. And we had originally envisaged two possible, two possible options, a, a steel composite uh, structure and a, uh, a classic uh, concrete box girder um, viaduct. What happened then is that um, HS2, rightly so, I realized that this was going to be really a, a key, a landmark structure uh, for the project overall. So they commissioned a specialist architect, Martin Knight, to really look at his specimen design whilst the contract had already started. So um, uh, Martin Knight uh, Architects, uh, shared a vision which was this uh, this arch viaduct that you see here on the original concept which was to remind stone skip uh, skimming stones over uh, the lake so uh, we were given this uh, concept and we were asked to then uh, develop a uh, design a structural design that would uh, use this concept with uh, still being practical and um, easier to build on the scale of a 3.4 kilometer viaduct. So the photo above is the original concept from the architect and the photo below is what we are actually uh, building today. So a structure which has this effect of skimming, skimming stones, but also uh, takes into consideration um, the structural aspects. So, and uh, that whole process took about two years to get to, to this point. So the other points to note on the um, on the architecture for the viaduct is that the architect had a clear vision. Uh, they wanted a curved soffit uh, uh, to give this aspect of uh, of arches or uh, skimming stones. 
uh, inclined panels to break uh, the deck, uh, the depth of the deck, which is quite significant. Huh? Uh, the deck at its deepest is nine meters and uh, vary the depth according to the context, uh, the, sorry, vary the spans and the depth according to the context where we are in the 3.4 kilometers, because obviously in the 3.4 kilometers, the landscape changes quite a bit and the view was to really adapt the viaduct as we were going through the landscape. So the viaduct is not repetitive, it's not the same from one end to the other. Um, so that obviously creates challenges. And the last point was that a great uh, emphasis on textures and facets, etc., to catch the light, provide shade was, uh, was envisaged by the architect. So I have to say, uh, hand on my heart, that in fact, when we started the process, Typical engineers were like oh, the architect or oh, creating all these complications, etc. In fact, now that we see the, uh, the the final product, and I'm not the only one to say it, actually the architect was right to really push push us to do something that is not just practical but also beautiful. Because at the end of the day, this is a landmark structure that's going to be here for 120 years plus. So for the sake, it would have been a shame to uh, do something that is not uh, as beautiful as what we are actually building now, just for the sake of a little bit of uh, ease of uh, construction. So you can see, as I was saying, various uh, different structures depending on the context uh, where we're crossing canals, etc. But we'll get to, to that point in a, in, a, in a few slides. A picture so uh, above the... Uh, the, the render of the, the design that we uh, carried forward and a couple of pictures, but we'll see better pictures in the next few uh, few slides of where we are today. So in terms of the technical design for the Comte Valley Viaduct, so a lot of you are, uh, are involved in real construction, so you will recognize a, a lot of this. So the Comte Valley Viaduct is a, a single single box, meaning that it's one deck which carries uh, two tracks plus uh, service walkways on the side, anti-derailment uh, barriers, noise barriers, uh, um, posts for the, uh, for the power catenaries, etc. And in terms of uh, structure, it's what we call a concrete uh, box girder. So it's a beam which is hollow with uh, three, uh, three cells. This is just really a terminology of the various elements. So if we start, uh, so you see uh, when we go into the next slide, so if we start from the very bottom, we have foundations which are board piles, so rotary board piles in uh, chalk. Uh, on top of these piles, typically eight piles per column, we have a, a reinforced concrete uh, pile cap or footing. Uh, which supports in its turn a solid uh, pier the column. Uh, on top of the column, there, was, there are elements that we call bearings, which are the intermediary between the, the deck and the column. And the deck itself is a uh, concrete box girder, which is built in a precast segmental manner with uh, post tensioning. Um, and then on top, you have the transfer slab for the track slab. It's a track slab. Sorry, track slab system, so it's not uh, ballast, um, which had some challenges with anti derailment parapets, noise barrier, um, which are uh, most of them built or large element built with what we call UHPFI, mm. which is ultra high performance fiber reinforced concrete. So that's the overview of what the main structural elements are. You can see the drawing, and more importantly, you see on the picture the actual cross section what uh, what it looks like yeah on the top and uh, right corner so the next uh, the next slide um i think a lot of you who are involved with uh, rail will uh, will uh, very much understand this we have a bridge which is 3.4 kilometers long we have of course uh, long welded rails because uh, on a high speed uh, train it's unthinkable to have a joints uh, uh, a large number of joints between rails. So this, uh, this is a long welded rail system, but we do need to have uh, rail expansion joints because otherwise it's just too much. The rail, the rail structure interaction becomes uh, problematic. So the structure is actually the 3.4 kilometers 
is broken down in four sections that we call modules. Module four from the north, which is where we started construction, going to module three, module two, and module one. Module two, three, four are about 900 meters long, and the last module is about half, half of that. And between these modules is where we have the rail expansion joints, and these are on a simply supported slab because it's to accommodate the movement, the relative movement between the concrete structure and the long welded uh, steel rail. Um, so the, the deck is interrupted at, uh, uh, is continuous for all the, for, on each module. And when you get to the end of the module, you, we will see you have a, a single span before we start the next module. And on that single span is where we accommodate the rail uh, expansion joints. In the middle of each module, of course, because we have significant uh, braking and, uh, and uh, traction uh, loading, longitudinal loads, we have uh, the point of longitudinal fixity, which is roughly in the middle of each module. And we will see how that is accommodated by a specific uh, special foundation and substructure slightly different from the typical ones. If we go to the next slide, Marwan, so a bit more technical details. So starting with foundations, I won't necessarily go into all the details. I mean, this is a presentation that uh, we've done with Marwan in the past. We can easily spend an hour and a half, but we don't have that time today. So I'll go a bit quickly. Rotary board piles, 1.5 meter diameter. So we, we, we drill a hole in the ground. Uh, that we stabilize with what we call a bentonite, which is a stabilizing uh, fluid. We uh, lower down the rebar cage, and with a tremi, we pump concrete, which displaces the bentonite, which is re recycled and reused on the next uh, on the next uh, uh, foundations. The pile caps uh, and piers, a classic reinforced concrete solution, so uh, placing reinforcement, placing formwork, and pouring concrete, with a small complication that. Uh, we have quite a few piers which are in the water, which obviously required what we call coffer dams to uh, do uh, construction of the um, of the footings in the dry. The columns you can see the architectural aspect, these various facets, so they are not just square uh, boxes. They have a facet with different structure, with different texture, which I believe gives a really really nice uh, architectural finish. Even though it did complicate our life quite a bit, but. The end result is very pretty. The bearings are uh, some of the largest bearings uh, we've ever installed on, on bridges, uh, very large spherical bearings. Uh, the photo doesn't really give it justice, but uh, some of these bearings are uh, as big as a dining room table. So very, very large bearings. In terms of the deck, this is where we spend a little bit more time. Uh, the deck design, it's a segmental bridge, meaning that the bridge is not pulled in one go, not assembled in one go, but is formed of what we call segments, which are a slice of bridge, uh, typically three, 3.5 meters long, depending where we are. And these elements have to be uh, built uh, Lego style, one against the other, to be able to uh, reach the, the final length of the viaduct. So this is done with what we call match casting. So match casting, what does it mean? It means that we cast the first segment, then we move this first segment slightly by a few meters, and the next segment that will go in the structure is cast against this first segment we've, we've done, which means that the two segments have been cast against one another, which means that we have a perfect fit of the surface between the two segments, which means that after we've stored them and we cured them, when we bring them to assemble them to the side, because they're all numbered and they're not interchangeable, each segment has a specific position within the bridge. When we bring the two segments again on the side and we glue them together, literally, then the, the, the faces of the segments will match perfectly without any uh, hole or hard points, etc. So this is what is called match casting. If we go to the next one, the next important point on the deck construction where we're spending a bit more time is the fact that what we use here is called a balanced cantilever um, construction. And uh, it means that we erect the segments which go on, on top of the column first, and then we add a segment one at a time on each side. So the deck grows from the center column 
towards uh, towards the middle of the spans. So we are not building a span, but we are building from a column going uh, half a span and half a span. And of course, on one side, you will see uh, on other photos, uh, it connects with the other cantilever or half span coming from the previous uh, pier. So this is what we call the balanced cantilever construction, and uh, it allows us to um, to build spans, which are here, the longest spans are 80 meters. So these are very long spans that we wouldn't be able to construct with other precast segmental methods, span by span, etc. So the, uh, the the method to build the, the, the bridge is adapted to, to the span. Two important points on the design, um, which I think uh, will interest people, is that uh, one is that this is the first reintroduction of precast segmental viaduct with internal post tensioning in the UK. Uh, as some of you may know, uh, based on accidents in the 80s, there was a first uh, moratorium uh, or ban, total ban on uh, use of internal post tensioning in uh, concrete bridges in the UK. The ban then got lifted saying, well, if it's internal, but these are segments cast in place, uh, then it's OK. And there was still a moratorium to this day on the use of uh, internal post-tensioning uh, inside concrete segments where we have joints between precast elements. And the view was that um, uh, because you have a discontinuity of the protection duct around the cable at the joint, the view is that it's a it's a point of entry for chloride for corrosion. And it's a weak point. However. The moratorium also and the, 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 the specifications recognize that technology has evolved quite a lot since the 80s and that if uh, we're able to demonstrate that we are uh, ensuring a positive connection of the post tensioning across the joints, which effectively means that you have the same level of encapsulation, whereas you're inside a segment or at a joint, then um, internal post tensioning uh, was then allowed with the other uh, proviso that uh, you demonstrate that you have a method to measure throughout time that the encapsulation or the protection layer around the cable remains effective throughout the life of the structure. So um, this is what was done and the reason for the internal post tensioning, I won't go into the details because uh, we don't have time, is with this type of construction, in order to have the spans required to meet the obstacles, etc., for this 3.4 kilometer, we cannot avoid having cables which run inside the concrete. Well, we do ha also have what we call external, which is a bit of a misnomer because they are not inside the concrete section itself, but they are inside the cavity within that box beam. So uh, external is a bit of a misnomer, but basically it's post tensioning that only touches the structures at a few points and doesn't run completely in case in the, in the concrete everywhere. So there's advantages to both types of system. And in fact, by combining these two systems, we get an optimum solution for this, uh, for this bridge. The, um, so uh, as I said, the challenge really was to demonstrate that we have a system that is robust with no weak points at the joint, and that is, uh, monitorable uh, in the long term. So this was done with a particular type of post tensioning, which is a VSL system, uh, which is called a PL3, so protection level three, which is the highest level that the specifications recognize today worldwide. Um, and it's a system that not only demonstrates a full encapsulation protection of the cable everywhere, but also is what we call uh, an EIT system, so electrically isolated tendons. And the idea being that um, the uh, structural steel of the cable is completely uh, isolated from an electrical point of view from the passive reinforcement, the rebar inside the concrete. Okay, And by uh, with that system, by measuring the resistance between the uh, the steel of the tendon and the steel of the rebar, um, the higher this resistance, you demonstrate that there are no uh, straight currents or leak currents that
that go from one to another. And if you don't have currents passing, then it means that you don't have chloride ions or any contamination ions that can penetrate within the encapsulation and corrode the strands inside. Okay. Again, a very, uh, very uh, important topic, very dear to my heart, so I could spend uh, hours talking about it, but unfortunately we don't. But uh, at the end, if you've got questions, I won't be here for questions. Uh, we'll take the questions and we will respond individually to, to some of the questions as, as required. The second uh, important point in terms of the technical aspects of the project was how do you manage to the design of a very complex structure uh, where, in fact, we have 1,000 segments on this structure. In terms of what we call the typical segments, uh, which are not the ones where you are over the peers, we have 111 different types, which means that we have very few segments that uh, look uh, the same. Uh, we have uh, different spans because of the architecture. We have this arch effect that needs to be perfect as we're changing spans. So, uh, quite a lot of complexity and not much repetitiveness on uh, on the structure of this uh, of this length. Uh, 57 spans is what we have, and typically on a very long structure, you would have a few types of cantilevers, a few types of segment, and you just repeat. But here, with the architectural vision and the desire to a very the structure shape uh, according to where we are in the 3.4 kilometer uh, length of the bridge. Uh, we ended up with nine cantilever types for these 57 spans, 111 typical segments, geometries, and 17 different what we call deviator sections. So quite a lot of uh, means the impact of such complexity, a lot of drawings, about 1500 rebar drawings, about 3000 uh, segment catalog drawings. So for each segment, each of the thousand segments, we have a catalog which gives the various drawings, the inserts, etc., the post tensioning that is required to build this particular slice, and uh, 3,000 uh, drawings. So, in average, three drawings for each uh, segment, which is a lot for uh, what should be a repetitive uh, structure. So, ob obviously, the impact is uh, delays, complexity, possibility of errors. Uh, quite a bit of resistance to changes when when changes are required. Um, it brings complexity to the casting cells, so the special formwork that we designed to cast segments. You can get errors in the drawings, etc. So really the solution was to have a lot of digital tools. So we did implement quite a few uh, digital tools. I think the next step really, we didn't implement it, but that would certainly be the next step on the structure of this complexity, is to construct directly from the model. So. We have a BIM model, obviously, for the entire structure, but it was felt at the time that in order to build, we had to translate the BIM model into drawings that uh, people on site would be more used to building. But definitely the step that the industry is going is directly building from, from the BIM models with augmented reality, etc. So that would be an improvement for the next structure. And really, the final point is that uh, it's absolutely essential at the start of a project to have a very good understanding of the expectations of the different parties. And because of a bit of floating at the start, that did create some complications. But we obviously we got uh, through it uh, because we have more than two thirds of the viaduct built, fantastic quality and a great safety record. So well, it is possible, even though you have a bit of difficulty at the start, to still achieve something very, very good. Uh, in terms of Casting cell, so what we call casting cell, and Marwan will, will show you a bit more later. This is effectively the name of the specialist formwork that is used to cast these segments, which are maximum 140 tons. So these are not small pieces. They are uh, 11 meters wide. The tallest are 9 meters tall, 3 meters long. So these are big lumps, complicated shape uh, that are cast in specialist formwork, which are called casting cells in the uh, in the industry. So these ones were totally modeled in 3D, and in fact, the fabrication was done directly from the BIM model by the fabricators, which avoided quite a lot of mistakes. But in the end, you always have a few bits and pieces, surprises when when everything comes together. But on a casting cells of this complexity, I think the the 3D modeling and the fabrication from the model avoided a lot of uh, 
a lot of errors that we would have seen traditionally uh, a few years ago before uh, before 3D modeling became so prevalent. Okay, if we go to the next, uh, so Marwan will will take you through a, a, a lot of uh, more details on the construction. He's the one with all the pretty pictures, so he's got uh, he's, he's got the best part of, of the presentation, and I think you'll be very very. Uh, uh, interested with uh, what he's got uh, to show to you. As I said at the very start, I'm really sorry, but I've got another meeting I've got to go to, uh, which means that Marwan may not have all the answers for some of the technical or design aspects, but Marwan is the project director in charge of uh, building the, the Videx superstructure. So on any construction uh, questions, he'll be a lot more familiar and a lot uh, better to answer than uh, than uh, 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 than I would be. Um, I think there's a few questions that uh, have come to the onto the chat. I guess, uh, Kate, do we wait until the very end for the questions? Is that uh, is that the plan, or do you want to address one or two of the if um, there are design the design questions that uh, I'm the best person to address yeah. quickly before we move on, as you wish. I mean, yeah, usually I do them at the end, but as you're going to be going, yeah, if you want to answer one of those two questions, yeah. then that, that'd be great. Thank you. Yeah, so the questions, uh, sorry, I didn't see the chat, but uh, I did see questions arriving, but I didn't have time to read them. Uh, how are the inclined panels made non-structural with the box? So the inclined panels are cast at the same time as the rest of the box. The only thing is that uh, the face of the panel is recessed by a couple of centimeters on each side which means that when we glue the segments, the, the inclined panels do not touch. So they are not part, the inclined parts are not part of the, uh, the longitudinal structural section, the section that gets compressed by the post-tensioning and experiences the shear and the, and the bending. The inclined panels have a function which is purely in terms of transverse resistance to hold, to help to hold the wings of the box in place plus the architectural effects, of course. But from a longitudinal global behavior of the deck, the inclined panels are not structural. There's They're only gap. structural in the transverse. There is a yeah, gap. There's a gap of 10 millimeter between each of the segments on the inclined panel inclined. Yeah. So even though they are cast at the same time of the box, by putting these little recess, we make sure that they don't touch from one from one segment to another, so they don't participate to the resistance of the longitudinal beam. Yeah. Uh, the second question: Could you please share the name of the VSL system for tendons coupling of the joint? Yes. So um, it's uh, what we call a PL3 system for VSL. So the couplers are called. Remind segmental. me the name. Segmental. Sorry? Yeah, segmental it's the VSL segmental coupler, we call them. I mean, very original uh, name, not, but uh, it does what it says on the tin. It's a coupler for the ducts or the protection of the cables through uh, through a segment joint. And that's, uh, that's couplers that have undergone uh, a lot of testing, which are certified, etc. And today, with uh, two thirds of the viaduct um, constructed, the results that we are picking uh, every time in terms of measuring the resistance, which we are doing on, res on a regular basis at various stages, uh, all the results so far are showing that the segmental couplers, in the case of the HS2 uh, C1 Convalley Viaduct, are working extremely well and are doing exactly what they're supposed to do. So we are achieving the high resistance that we are um, we are contracted to achieve with the PT system. There's one more, one more question for you. I might Maybe. have uh, I might have time for one more question and then I'll have to go. Uh, this end plate or isolation plate, it appears so small. Um, yes, so what happens is that uh, traditionally in post-tensioning, you have what we call the anchorage block, which is the uh, the um, the, the big circular piece of uh, steel that bears against the cast iron uh, uh, trump, uh, which we call the, uh, the casting, which is cast into the concrete. So typically these two uh, steel elements are in contact, which means that there is no electrical isolation. So what happens here is that, first of all, inside this casting, you, we have a plastic trumpet, which means that the strands, the post-tensioning strands cannot touch the side of the casting uh, in the concrete because you have this uh, this uh, 
second uh, plastic sleeve around and between the casting and the uh, the anchorage block you have a uh, a non-conductive material but with very very hard compressive uh, uh, strength which is between the two meaning that the the strand touches the anchor block because this is where you have the wedges that anchor it but the anchor block doesn't touch the casting which is in the concrete because you have this isolation plate and the isolation plate in fact is just slightly bigger than uh, than the anchorage block and that is enough to uh, break the electrical contact between the two elements and then after we have another plastic uh, cap going around to protect this which also uh, bears onto the onto the uh, the isolator plate so in fact the whole system you have no electrical contact between what we call the structural part which is the strand uh, and the anchorage block and the wedges and the non-structural the casting and uh, because the casting is in uh, contact with the rebar which are inside the concrete so you have a perfect electrical isolation between the tendon element and the passive steel that is on the outside i hope I that think, answers uh, the question i think frederick the, the question if that's the the one with the photo i think uh, the gentleman saying the casting well what we see the end plate in reality this is the casting of the external post tensioning looks very small compared to the loads so this is not only a plate maybe to answer it's not only a plate this is a casting so uh, a cast iron element that is cast inside the concrete and behind this there is a uh, a lot of uh, bursting reinforcement and the reinforcement of the segment. So this is part of the uh, post tensioning catalog and the, the, the casting and the anchorage uh, has been designed for a certain strength of concrete uh, and calculated and tested uh, fatigue test, etc. for this. So yeah, the, the, the casting good. also has a series of rings behind it and all the series of rings. This is all uh, uh, designed and uh, certified per uh, European technical agreement, of course, yeah. And uh, this whole system of casting is capable of, you're right, these are very large uh, forces because if you take one strand, okay, and here in this case, uh, these external tendons uh, go up to 37 strands, each strand is uh, 20 tons, right? So 37 strands, that's a cable. That cable is putting a force of 740 tons in that location. And whilst it looks maybe a, a bit small, it is perfectly designed and um, perfectly designed to transfer that force. And it's a system, it's a product. In fact, it's an industrial product for VSL that is uh, placed all over the world and which comes with all the technical agreements that, uh, that you would expect. Um, so sorry, so I misunderstood the, the questions, but in fact, on that picture, uh, first, the external tendons are not electrically isolated. They are not because they are external, but um, that little isolation plate, in fact, is even smaller than this, uh, this square plate that you've highlighted in red. Uh, it's between the sizes, between the anchorage block, the circular part, and the square, which is the casting. Sorry, so I hope uh, hope that answers the questions. And I really apologize, but I'm going to have to uh, to go. But I leave you in the extremely capable hands of Marwan. So uh, do enjoy the rest of the presentation. And if you have further questions, send some uh, questions through through email, and we'll uh, we'll try to uh, address them uh, as quickly as we can. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank Good you, evening. Frederick. Good Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Over tomorrow, and then. Yes, uh, good afternoon everyone. Yeah, so we'll go now through a section that is maybe more uh, down to earth, if I might say. So the construction methods and quite a few techniques that were used to construct the, the viaduct. Okay, okay so uh, yeah, the convey viaduct, the main constraints that we had were uh, basically a few crossings. So we had two roads to cross. Uh, which is done. We have two rivers, a canal, and uh, high voltage power lines. And uh, basically, the construction is there are two types of construction on the viaduct. On 3.4 kilometer, we have two thirds of it, which is over land, uh, and one third, which is really over uh, the water. And that has been done with temporary jetty platforms. So, land based construction, what you see here, is the first section of the bridge that is 
already completed structurally with the deck, the uh, solid barriers and the parapets. The only thing missing to have the final view of it or aesthetically would be the sound barriers that will be coming above the, the parapet here. This has been constructed so there, uh, mainly in the valley, uh, we had an access road at the ground, so that's a whole road that's uh, running all along the, the construction uh, site so by that. And uh, when reaching uh, into the water, we had coffer dams to limit the groundwater, which is very close to the ground level. Now, uh, in terms of uh, methods of construction, so the idea of constructing that balance gap lever was to do with the launching entry in order to uh, reduce the impact of uh, Carbon and instead of refabricating a new machine, the, the project or the, the idea of, of a line was to reuse a launching entry that was previously used in uh, Asia. So used initially in a project in Hong Kong, uh, which is its Singhi Viaduct. And then this uh, launching entry, as it was already existing and already designed, had limitations in terms of the weight of the segment it can lift. So the two inches on the machine can lift up to 140 tons or 150 tons uh, if we don't consider lifting beams. So basically the segmentation of the bridge of the viaduct was readjusted in order to match the maximum capacity uh, of the launching gantry. Uh, so that was one of the constraints that were defined when defining the, the geometry of the bridge. In fact. Uh, in order to do that, so as the LG was already uh, already existing and have already been used for, uh, for a few years on different projects, it had to be rechecked against the Eurocode. It had to be checked uh, for the wind load. So it went uh, through different tests of uh, uh, tunnel testing, wind tunnel testing, uh, in 3D tunnel testing and physical ones. So a model was fabricated of a launching gantry and it was uh, checked into the tunnel. Uh, analysis were uh, compiled to check everything was OK and fatigue was checked as well as it was being used for the first time. In terms of assembly of the launching gantry, uh, one of the changes that were done from initial uh, assembly, so the, basically the launching gantry we're speaking of, we have two trusses we see here, uh, two trusses, each one of them uh, has 100, is 150 meter long. The overall assembly, the full assembly of the LG is around 700 tons. In order to assemble this uh, while uh, preparing the platform on which it was assembled, as the platform was, uh, let's say, running late due to weather constraints, the, the assembly of the truss was started on the side, so not in the final position, but next to it. So while the truss were being assembled on, on the platform here, the earthworks and the foundations for the first launching were being done uh, next to it. By the time the platform was uh, ready, the slabs or the, the pads were ready, the temporary supports we see here, those are red beams here, were installed in their final position. Then uh, the truss that was erected on the ground was jacked up on those uh, hydraulic jacks here, on the, the slack of uh, ships here. So it was jacked up to the final level and then moved with the SPMTs into position and then lowered onto, onto the supports before the first launch. So we'll go now into the first uh, uh, small video to show how the launching gantry works. So the machine itself is composed of two long truss uh, of uh, 150 meters, as we said. It has two main supports, uh, which we call the TBs or transversal beams, we see here, here, here the two double, uh, double beams here. And it has two uh, lighter legs, uh, so the front and rear legs. We see one uh, just here behind the TB, and the front one is just here that are uh, hanging up in the air. These allow uh, to, let's say, the launching entry to land on the piers during the, the process of launching. See now a small video that shows how the launching entry moves. So basically we are crawling the machine forward, uh, moving the truss on the supports and then uh, landing onto the pier. So here the launching entry lands on the first pier. We bring in the first uh, pair of segments, so the, what we call the segments on piers or SOPs. They are placed on the pier then we do post tensioning with those two segments. We launch the main truck or the main support onto the LG, prepare the pair of segments that will come from the back and bring them into position. Now, once we are here, I'm sure if I can hold it. 
So basically, once we have the two segments that are in position, sorry, once the two segments are uh, are in position on both sides of the pin, once we have a pair of segments on both sides of the pin in position, we have one pair of tendons that run through those two segments that are stressed. This will create a balanced cantilever or cantilever that is self-supported and able to take the load of the next pair of segments. So here we have the first two segments. Here, once these are in position, we launch the machine to be centered over the, the pier. So this is one. And then we get the first two cantilever segment. One will be placed on each side of the pier assembly. So these are first two segments. Here there is a layer of post-tensioning. And then one, another pair of segments, another pair of cables, another pair of segments, another pair of cables until we go to the end. So the launching gantry has been upgraded quite a lot since it was used on its first project. A uh, lot of sensors were added on the machine, which allow basically to follow uh, remotely the loads on the machine at any point in time. And this was coupled with a few algorithms and sensors that allow to analyze the movements of the different parts of the launching gantry, the loads on the if switches. And this allows to do a, a very precise follow-up of the cycle. So we see here the cycles of the different cantilevers in number of days, and the algorithm will on its own calculate the number of segments erected uh, and the progress of one. Another change that was done to the launching gantry from its initial setup was the use of uh, lifting beams uh, with what we call the ADEL system. This basically allows uh, to lift a segment without the need to go on top of the segment. So I said the segments are up to seven meter high, uh, in order to pick them up, if we have to go on the top to hook the segment to the beam, uh, this is additional risks. That means people working at height. Uh, and the use of this system allows basically to pick up the segment from the top slab by inserting those fingers into the segment. So we have four recesses in the segment. We insert those ADEL fingers in. Then for, by remote control from the, the ground level or from the deck level, the operator will engage those red uh, locks which will basically rotate. So from the vertical position, they will rotate into horizontal. It will lift up, they come in contact with the segment and then can lift it up without the need to go uh, on top. Now, going more into the general construction or the cantilever construction, as we are, uh, const uh, we are constructing uh, cantilever, so basically we have loads coming on both sides. Uh, this means that the structure during this temporary stage is not uh, specifically stable, or not necessarily stable, and the overturning moment when we put a segment on one side is quite big. That means that the, uh, above the pier, we have very little space uh, to take those out of balance movement, uh, as the pier are just a few meter, a few meter wide, it's a top view of the pier here. We have, when we erect the first pair of segments, it's quite congested, we have segments under the first pair of segments, the bearings that are already in position, and that doesn't give much space. Once we uh, we put the first pair of segments, when we start going out of that area, it is uh, quite high loads coming down. In order to take that out of balance movement, basically we use a set of props, temporary props, which we see here in gray, that are uh, assembled and fixed outside of the pier or around the pier under the first pair of segments that are in cantilever with uh, big jacks on top, and we use two levels of nailing, which allows basically to clamp down the structure that is supporting as well the launching gantry on top, to clamp it down to the ground to take those uh, out of balance movement. In order to do those props uh, and to be uh, efficient, the props had to be uh, uh, modular, so they allowed to be adjusted. Uh, so we had most of the modules are 2.5 meters, and then we had smaller modules that were used to get to the proper height, depending on the height of the of the piers, and all the piers have different height. One of the main points uh, that was considered as well by the technical center of ESL when designing temporary props was the ease of dismantling it and making sure that we are able to dismantle them within the cycle of uh, of operation. So they were designed with those lever arms, and they can be picked up from the NG after. The loads are released, they can be picked up uh, with the launching gantry from the top and moved out in order to be transported after to the next location. So the same props that we can see here, which are taken out of balance, are used as well with an extension in order 
for to receive the launching get ready during the launching phase. So once we are launching the the LG uh, to the following peer, the front leg uh, will come at the same level than the deck. So we use an extension here, which will take that load uh, during the launching of the machine. And the machine basically will come sit on that prop, which is out of the peer uh, itself, which will allow as well enough space here to position the first two segments, uh, the peer segments, before we transfer the main supports uh, to proceed further. So on top of those props, in order to take all those loads and to take the naming forces, we have on top of each of the props, two jacks of 1,000 tons with the top plate, uh, it's an inclined plate which, are, which is machined, in fact, uh, in order to resist any uh, sliding. So that's giving additional friction to resist any sliding due to the inclined face that we have made. So all the loads go back down through the webs, you see here, those webs that are transferring all the loads uh, down to the to the props uh, themselves. Uh, just one more point compared to the we were discussing earlier about the cantilever post tensioning. We see here the castings on top of the segment, which will take basically the cantilever post tensioning from one segment to the symmetrical segment on the other side of the building. And finally, in order to give that whole stability, we have two levels of nailing. One which is on the peer segments directly into the peer, just the loops. And the other one, which comes down from the beam on the top, through the segments all the way to the to the ground, to the pipe gap. Here we see the nailing inside the peer segment. So those are the cables that we see here at the lower level. And on top, we have beams that are transferring this load from the position where the cable can run down onto the uh, the webs, and, uh, nailed all the way down into the pipe gap. We see the cables here. They are coming down from the top slab all the way through the, the props, all the way down into the pile cap, which is somewhere at this level, and I curved with uh, the ground is somewhere. In order to do the post tensioning during the, the erection of the cantilever, we always need to access the edge. Uh, as we are using the PL3 system, and we want to ensure that all the ducts and the joints are fully sealed after the gluing of the segment, we have a platform that allows access at the same time to the top slab, uh, to uh, do the threading and the stressing of the top tendons and to the bottom slab to do the trial or the test of each uh, seals during the construction. So we needed the platform that allows uh, to cover that whole height. As we were limited with the widths of the machine, we had to go with the design of platform that was in aluminium. Otherwise, the auxiliary widths of the launching gantry would not be able to take them. Again, during the construction, in order to keep the cantilever stable and the last pair of segments stable before we do the post tensioning. Uh, the segments are glued together and they are uh, compressed. The joints are compressed. So the shear keys that we see here are compressed together by use of temporary PT at two levels. So we have one level of temporary PT on the top slab uh, that we see here using brackets that are self locking into the top slab, the stress bars across the joints. So we see here the joints of the segment. We see the segment lifting beads here. These are the segments that are erected. We see the epoxy joint, and we stress bars across the joint to lock the segments together, to compress the joint, squeeze the epoxy throughout. And the same is, is done as well at the bottom level with PT bars, or post tensioning bars that are going through concrete blisters, in that case, with different uh, shapes depending on the type of uh, span. It can be either horizontal, as we see here on the bars, or it can be inclined when we are on an inclined uh, soft. Now, one of the special uh, uh, special uh, techniques of construction, or one of let's say of the areas that is slightly different than the standard cantilever, is the VP. This is what being explained earlier by by Frederick. So the architectural feature of the project, that uh, V shape that's giving that skimming effect. Uh, here we are not on a standard cantilever where the segments are on here. We have a shape that's slightly different. So. In order to do that, uh, basically two stages of construction were done. So what we see here in dark gray uh, was the VP itself with two uh, cast in place segments, which was done uh, in situ on top of the jetty. And then all the lighter gray ones were uh, cast uh, again in precast segment in the precast yard and transported to the site and erected with the launching gantry. To give you a bit more. Uh, of an idea of the scale or the size of those VP. Uh, it, there is roughly 500 cubic meters of concrete. The overall weight is around 2,000 tons. 
you see the density of steel that we have here, the size of one mile. It's a, it's a really massive structure that was built uh, on the jetty. Uh, so see here the formwork, everything here was, was poured, let's say, in two stages. So the first stage is this one here, and then on top there is only the second, that's the second stage. So quite massive concrete. Uh, it had to be done over the temporary jetty, so a lot of subjects of differential settlement and uh, self-support uh, of that structure, which required as well to have internal post-tensioning inside the VPL to keep that shape uh, basically together when uh, to de prop the shutter. So basically after casting that VPL, we stress six cables of post-tensioning that are going through the VPL uh, before the prop uh, shutter can be uh, strike off uh, basically. Again, the uh, the VPs during the construction were supported in uh, four points. So under the soffit and under the forework, we had four columns, uh, with top of which we had a stack of uh, shims that basically will take the, the load once we strike off the forework, that will take the load of the VP itself and keep it in position until we, uh, we are able to adjust it during the construction. So here we will see uh, the sequence of construction of the VPL itself with the launching gantry. You will notice inside the VPL there is a, an infill uh, structure that is used to support the first pair of segment and to receive the front leg of the launching gantry. So the launching gantry is launched into the VPL. We support the front leg. We put the first pair of segments. Then again, we will transfer the front main support on top of those two segments, release the front leg, clear the area. And then from here, we are able to Elect the remaining three segments uh, inside. Once the infill is done, there is one uh, first line of uh, cast in situ stitches that are uh, cast here. So we adjust those segments, we cast those stitches, and we do a first level of permanent post tensioning uh, through that VP, then to make it all monolithic. Let's say once this is done, the rest of the construction is constructed in a normal cantilever. So we put the first uh, segments outside. We see here the first five segments, infill segments that are erected over that temporary structure or the infill structure that is itself nailed down into the VP, which is itself nailed down into the pipe cap. So we have two layers of uh, two levels of nailing in order to stabilize the whole section. Now, before we do that, the stacks of shims that we have seen earlier have been removed, replaced with four jacks of 2,000 tons at the four corners, which will allow the adjustment of the cantilever once completed to match the previous cantilever uh, in terms of uh, geometry control. So a few photos during the, the assembly, so they actually wanted three shoes, but then this one again completed. Once the first uh, five segments are completed and the post-tensioning, we see here the post-tensioning cables going from one phase to the other uh, are stressed, then we go into the next uh, segment, so we have another two segments outside of that VPL with, again, two stitches that are to be cast. So these segments are adjusted on top of towers to match the geometry. We cast those stitches, again, one level of post-tensioning, and then we go into the real uh, cantilever. So one of the challenges there as well was to remove that uh, big frame from inside the VPL after the construction segments. For this, we use a sliding system, basically, that is going under that frame jack it up with small hydraulic jack, slide it out, and once it is out in position like here, it's picked with the crane, removed, and sent to the next location to be to it in the final position or in the following VP. The segment transport on the project was these hydraulic trailers, NSPMTs. So from the precast yard, which is one and a half kilometer away from the start of the viaduct, on the whole road, it was a use of self-propelled trailers connected with uh, SPMTs connected with the, the trailer and on the deck itself it's self-propelled machine with the power pack at the back uh, to transport them on the deck. Uh, match cast, this is what was uh, explained earlier by Frederick. So we just have a, a small video that will show basically the process of the match cast in the casting yard. Basically the segment that is already cast is brought into position and it's sitting here Next to the casting cell, we will insert the cage, the rebar cage, into the formwork and uh, fill 
cast in like that uh, segment. The segment that was previously cast is moved out. The segment that was recently cast is moved to match that position. We reinstall again the formwork, adjust the height of the formwork, put the new cage inside, and then maybe so again. As the segments are a variable height because of that cantilever R shape, the height of the segment is changing every time. So every time we cast one segment, we remove the bottom part of the former, which is the, the bottom for me, which is adjustable on a sort of a stack of different shapes to get the proper height. So this one is reused every time. We move the segment together with the bottom form from its current position after casting. So when it's still uh, wet, we strike the former mainly only on the side and on the inside, but the segment is still supported from the bottom uh, because it's sitting on the table. That table is relocated into the match cast position, so we don't lift the segment, we take it from the bottom. So basically, it can be done at very early stage or very early age, when the concrete is still not very hard. It's moved into the new position. We install the following table, so the next one in. It's adjusted to match the height of the one already cast and the final geometry. The formwork is closed again on the sides. All the ducts that are uh, installed in the cage are connected to the ones that are previously cast with a specific set of tools to make sure all the ducts are continuous and are properly fixed. Then we pull the next segment. And again, by the time the segment here is pulled, this one is already uh, hard enough, so it has already passed 48 hours roughly. It is moved out of the way, and then the gantry crane that is on the outside will pick it up. Uh, from the, the holes, so you don't see here, it's the system and uh, moved into location. Now here we will see a time lapse of uh, exactly the same works, but uh, so here we see the cast uh, segment that is already in position. This one is the new one that was cast, the other one is out, so it goes very fast, but the segment is cast and then it's moved out with the, with the cart. So there is a cart that will come from below the table and we pick up, you can see it coming in and out here at the bottom. It will come under that table, uh, again, hydraulic jacks that will allow to run it one more time. Uh, you can, if you look at the bottom, you will see that there is a cut coming in and out uh, under, the, under the table. You see it here is position, and, and this will be used to move the segment uh, out and bring the other one in. So the card is used to move the segment and in the same time to adjust the match cast segment before casting the flowing one. So the, the principle of match cast basically as we have a geometry uh, to control very precisely to get the final shape of, your, of the bridge that you want. The, in, the, in, in principle, we have a, a, a casting curve that is defined by the designer at the very stage. And every time we cast one segment, we will do a survey of the pair of segments. So the newly cast segment, and the previously cast segment, they are surveyed together and we check that the geometry is matching with the theory. Any modification, so we have, let's say we have a tolerance of uh, 5 mm, any modification that's outside of the tolerance is adjusted by readjusting the position of the match cast before, before casting the following segment. So basically, we will always readjust the new segment to uh, correct the curve when casting the next one. So if, let's say you go up 5 mm, well, you correct on the next one to bring it back down 5 mm. And as you go, you never add up errors. You always keep that tolerance uh, within the same unit. This is done by a surveyor that will be uh, using the towers here. And now the latest development that is implemented on the project and has been running now for a couple of months is to have an automatic adjustment of the match cast uh, with, uh, let's say, a laptop and a smart system that will measure basically the survey of the points and will automatically give the movement on uh, onto that cart to adjust the segment hydraulically without uh, human intervention or without having to go doing the reading again and again. The whole time was the surveyor would read, tell the guys, okay, jack up uh, five millimeter in this corner, down two millimeter in this one, then the guys uh, adjust the hydraulic jacks, okay, no, you went too far, etc. and three bits. Now all those cycles are done uh, by uh, laptop, so the surveyor himself will do the survey, which is done automatically, but the feedback goes back into the computer. The computer will uh, increment the hydraulic jacks by the necessary movement to get to the final geometry. And a final, final small video, this is a time lapse that will show the construction that was done over 
the A412, that was the first crossing of roads that was done last uh, October, sorry, October 2022. Uh, so here we were limited because that's a, a road that is used as a alternate route uh, for the M25 in case of accident on M25. The A412 is one of the escape routes, basically. So we were not allowed to uh, close it more than five hours, six hours per night. So all the election was to be done during the night between 10 p.m. and 5 a.m. And we had to be able to reopen it within a couple of hours in case of major issue on, on M25. So uh, this was done quite successfully. You can see it one more time. So we'll see uh, on this one. During the day, the back segment of the cantilever was being erected. And during the night, we erect the segment that is over the road. So the road is closed, the segment is erect, put in position, clean everything. Uh, and get ready to open it in the morning. Once this cantilever was completed, which is basically arriving up to uh, halfway above the room here, the following cantilever that we see on this side was erected in the same manner, but going backwards until we connect to the same point. So uh, that's a bit uh, everything for, for now. Uh, thank you for listening. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Thank you, Mara. I, I, I think that was a great overview of the design and the construction of the how, how the viaduct was done. It's very, very, very impressive. Um, and I think also it's quite evident that there's a lot of effort, effort has been made in to reduce the visual impact on the surrounding. So, you know, as, as it was mentioned at the beginning with, with all the architecture, the structure looks absolutely beautiful. So I think it's a very, very good job that the team has done. Um, so we've got a couple of questions. Firstly, does anybody want to ask their question? Or if not, I'll go to the chat and I'll just read out. I think we've got two questions that have been added. OK, I'll read the first one. So the first one's from Claudio. So basically said, very interesting presentation. So well done to you both. Um, how many and what size were the tie down tendons utilised at the peer segments to cope with the loss of segment scenario? The the biggest uh, the biggest nailing uh, cables we have are six twenty two. So we have twenty two strands of fifteen point seven. This one, but again, the as we said, they, we had four cables uh, nailing. So we have the four cables on the segment one, and we have two cables or two U tendons in the peer segment. But depending on the type of cantilever, it, uh, we could have uh, smaller cables or bigger cables. The biggest one are uh, twenty two strands times four. Uh, I think uh, there was a question. Uh, yeah. Another one. Uh, another question asked Basha. So, yeah. what what are the key factors to consider when determining the required pre camber adjustment, if any, for viaduct beams subjected to the railway loads? And then, how do these factors influence the adjustments of the final loads process? Hmm. Uh, this might be more of a question for Frederick, I would say. Uh, uh, however, no, I can I can I can speak a bit more about the precamber and the way it is done for the balance cat river construction, which I know quite well. The final interface with the final final loads from the trains are not 100 percent sure because this really is the designer. What? But in in principle, in terms of uh, of uh, of precamber, uh, this is what we say. What what has to be considered in the type specifically in the balance cantilever construction is that as you construct the cantilever geometry or the, the shape of the bridge is changing all the time. So every time we put a pair of segments, we have a deflection that is due to the self weight of the segment. There is deflections that are due to the working loads, and then you will stress the post tensioning cable that will bring back up the, the cantilever into a different uh, shape. Uh, so that's during the uh, construction of the cantilever itself. Then there is uh, they, at a later stage, once you connect the two uh, cantilever together, and we have the uh, continuity, I mean, I'll switch back on some of the photos that on some of the slides that might explain. We have the continuity post tensioning that is coming between the two cantilevers. This has as well an effect on the overall geometry of the deck. And uh, the last level, which is basically the external post tensioning that is coming uh, as well across two or three spans, depending on the length of spans. Uh, will have one more effect on the geometry. So basically, the, the design is done uh, backwards 
from the final geometry that we are expecting once we have all the superimposed load. Uh, we remove the superimposed load to know what it should look like basically before these loads come in. Uh, then we, this would be, okay, so the final stage is when you have the external post tensioning. So before the superimposed load come on the deck, which is basically the parapets, the barriers, uh, the transfer slab, the rails, everything, the, the geometry uh, is defined or is finally adjusted by that external PT. These are stressed, the viaduct takes its final shape. And then at that stage, we can start putting the, the permanent loads or the dead loads on top of the barriers, the parapet, etc. Uh, so once this is done, the gas can start installing the parapet. Before that, the previous stage that will affect the geometry as well is the uh, stressing of the bit span uh, stitch continuity PT. So this is the post tensioning that goes between two cantilever. When this is stressed, it will affect as well that geometry. And before that, during the construction of single cantilever, so basically we're looking only at that cantilever itself. Every time we put a pair of segments, the cantilever has a tendency to deflect. We stress the cantilever, it goes up. So all this information is included in the model. And uh, basically we know, or, or we have a geometry system that will define at every stage of construction where the tip of the cantilever should be and what the level of each of the segments should be. So during the construction, uh, this is monitored. Every time we put a pair of segments, the surveyor will uh, survey the cantilever itself, check what is the position of the tip of the cantilever on each side after stressing the post-tensioning, and check that this is in line with the uh, model. If it is not, then we, we will adjust as we go, and we keep adjusting this until we get to the end of the cantilever. Once the whole cantilever is completed, it is adjusted with the use of the jacks that are on top of the prop to match the previous cantilever before pulling the stitch. So we have to make sure that the cantilever is in exact position to have a matching with the previous one. So we have a tolerance of 20 mm, 25 mm at the, at the tip. The stitch is pulled, we stress, and then again we survey where we are. After that, there is one more layer of uh, post tensioning, as we said, which is the external post tensioning, which will give the final shape before we start putting the dead loads. I'm not sure if that really answers the question, but uh, uh, that's the process as it is going now. Yep, he said, thank you very much for the clear explanation. So I think, yep, that did answer the question. <laughs> okay, um, just one last question then from me. So how did you guys, or the H2 project, how did you engage with the, the local community and stakeholders in sort of planning, the planning and construction of the viaduct? Yeah, so uh, in fact, Align, uh, I have to say, have a very good uh, communication team and they have done a lot, a lot, and they still do quite a lot of work uh, upstream with all the communities. They were engaged at all the stages, basically, even of, of designing the, the project uh, in different, uh, different phases. Uh, to give you an example, the tunnel, uh, the, or the, the tunnel of the viaduct, or not the viaduct, sorry, the tunnel of the project, have uh, four shafts along the the tunnels that uh, that are either emergency shaft or aeration shafts. So these will finish will be uh, at the top of each of the shaft. You have a technical building that will be visible at certain point. In order to uh, integrate those ones into the the environment, there was a, a sort of workshops that were done with the local communities in order to look into the design of those buildings to see how to best integrate them. And finally, the the, the four different buildings have different. Uh, shapes or different looks that are looking slightly like an uh, old farm and basically the, the whole technical uh, uh, technical building is uh, hidden in the, in the let's say the, that uh, landscape by looking exactly like uh, any old farm etc so it's really good. now in terms of uh, noise and, uh, and the other constraints for the for the population there is uh, hotlines that are uh, that are open by hs2 uh, any complaints are recorded on system and there is, a, uh, again, before any new activity is undertaken, consents are being uh, being cleared by the consent team uh, with the local council, with the, the people, etc. And uh, uh, basically everything is is uh, prepared ahead with the, with the local communities uh, in order to avoid as much as possible the disturbance. Obviously, there is always uh, things that uh, some uh, some uh, comments that would come in, but they are treated with uh, 
by HS2 and Align uh, on day to day, and we, we connect as we need. Uh, there is as well a very interesting uh, visitor center that has been set up by uh, by Align on the on the South Portal layout, which explains everything that is being done uh, uh, to protect the environment, uh, to uh, uh, integrate the local communities, uh, etc. So, to give an example, on the launching gantry, for example, we have all the lights that are on the launching gantry, all the lights in general that are over the jetty had to be changed to a specific type of lights that do not, uh, uh, let's say, uh, endanger the local uh, fauna. So there is a type of bats that is very sensitive to lights uh, that is uh, uh, living in the, in the area here. So we had to change all the lights to have lights that do not bother the, uh, the bats. Uh, so a lot of control on the noise. Uh, so everything is very, very, uh, say very well squared or encased. Okay, thank you. I mean, once again, Marit, thank you. I think that was a fascinating presentation and thank you for um, finding the time to come and speak to the PWI. I think um, there was one question, uh, if I may, from before when Frederick was here, from Mr. Randolph Chung, I think, uh, was asking how many days are needed to erect and stress a segment. Uh, yeah, so this, uh, we can't say this, that's too much. Uh, on average, or on cycles, the best cycles we have done is around four hours to erect a pair of segments, erect them and stress them. On average, we uh, we are erecting between three and three and a half pairs of segments uh, per day, uh, which gives a cantilever or a one cantilever. The, the shortest we have done until now is four and a half days for a span of 60 meters for a full cycle. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, just for everyone who's left in the PWI, um, our next technical talk, this will take place face-to-face -face at our new venue at Sistra, so that'll be in Alpha Tower. Uh, the next talk will basically be uh, in Johnson from D-Gage, and they'll be discussing the transitional methodology and clearances. So that will be uh, March the 21st at 5 p.m. Um, this will be an in-person one, so there is limited spaces, so please do get yourself booked on as soon as possible if you would like to attend that. But yeah, once again, Mark, thank you again for your time. Um, I will end the meeting there, as no one else has any more questions. And thank you. Everyone, take care. Have a good evening. Bye-bye. Thank you, guys, for hosting us. Bye-bye.